Kylo Limit Loren back talking to you about AP questions involving limits. Now here's a question. What type of cup did Han prefer to drink from? Red Solo Cups! <laughs> First question says the graph of the function f is shown below which of the following limits does not exist. So here we have the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x. Does this exist? So here's our function right here. And you can see that the limit as x approaches 1 from the left, if we follow our function, as x approaches 1, it looks like the y value goes to 0. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x equals 0. For part B, we have the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. And that is just testing you on whether the limit from the left and from the right as x approaches 1 are the same. We figured out the limit as x approaches 1 from the left equals 0. So does the limit as x approaches 1 from the right also equal 0? It does. Yes, you can see as you follow the function as x approaches 1 from the right, it also equals 0. Therefore, the limit from the left and the right are equal. So you can say that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x also equals 0. For part C, the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x, does this exist? As x approaches 3 from the left, values less than 3, you can see that our y value goes to 2. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x equals 2. Part D, it's testing you on the same knowledge that it tested you on in part B, which is do the limit from the left and the right as x approaches 3 equal one another. So we have the limit as x approaches 3 from the left, we figured out was 2. But the limit as x approaches 3 from the right looks like it's going to be equal to negative infinity. Therefore, the limit from the left and the right as x approaches 3 are not equal. So the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x does not exist. Lastly, we have the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x. And you can see from the left, the limit as x approaches 5 from the left is going to equal approximately, I don't know, 4.6. And then the limit as x approaches 5 from the right also equals about 4.6, right? They have the same y value here. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x equals approximately 4.6. And the question was, which of the following limits does not exist? That would be D, the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. Question 2 says, if f is a continuous function such that f of 2 equals 6, which of the following statements must be true? So first, we're going to look at the limit as x approaches 1 of f of 2 times x equals 3. So this question is actually testing you on the properties of limits. So the first one would be the limit as x approaches 1 of f of 2 times x equals 3. Well, we're taking the limit as x approaches 1. So since we're given that f of 2 equals 6, what we can do is anytime you're taking the limit as x approaches some value c, you can take that c value and plug it in for x and see if it comes out equal to what we're given up here. So the limit as x approaches 1, I plug in 1 for x, and f of 2 times 1 is actually just f of 2. Now, does f of 2 equal 3? No, we were just told that f of 2 equals 6. Therefore, this cannot be true. Now, part B is testing you on the constant multiple rule, which we remember says the limit as x approaches c of some value times f of x is equal to that same value times your limit. So up here, we know that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is going to equal 6. So does this mean the same thing as this? Well, f of 2 times x is not the same thing as 2 times f of x. Here, you're multiplying 2 to your x value. Here, you're multiplying 2 to your y value or f of x value. Therefore, these two things are not the same, so this cannot be true. If this had been the limit as x approaches 2 of 2 times f of x equals 12, that would have been true. But since it's not, it's not. Here we have the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x minus f of 2 all over x minus 2 equals 6. Now, this is the alternative form of the derivative of f of x at c equals 2. Because this means f prime of 2 equals 6, it's not going to be true because we're given that f of 2 equals 6. That doesn't mean that f prime of 2 equals 6. So this doesn't necessarily have to be true. Part D, we have the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x squared equals 36. Now, this is testing your power rule for limits. And what that says is the limit as x approaches c of f of x squared equals l squared, your limit squared. So if this is squaring your x value, it's not necessarily the same as squaring your f of x value or your y value. Therefore, these two things are not compatible. They're not true. So part E, which it looks like must be the one that's true, and it is. It's testing you on the exact same thing that this was your power rule for limits which says if you square your function and take the limit as x approaches c then your limit must also be squared so if the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x equals 6 then the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x squared equals 36 right which is 6 squared so this must be true
Question three says, for which of the following pairs of functions f and g is the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x infinite? So it's basically just asking you to find the limit as x approaches infinity of each of these with f of x over g of x and see which one produces a limit of infinity. So let's go ahead and rewrite this first one as the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x. Now, your two most powerful, most dominant terms in the numerator and denominator are going to be this x squared here and this x squared. Because they have the same degree, you're going to actually look at their coefficients in order to find the limit as x approaches infinity, right? This is going to go to infinity squared, and this is going to go to infinity squared. So these are going to produce the same numbers, which means this is going to be about 1. So you need to look at the coefficients of those two values in order to figure out what the limit as x approaches infinity is going to be. Remember, these you can kind of disregard because x squared is going to produce a way bigger number than 2x as x approaches infinity and same thing with ln of x as x approaches infinity this is not going to be nearly as big as x squared so we can disregard those and just look at the x squareds and the coefficients are just 1 over 1 so the limit as x approaches infinity of this rational function is going to be 1 over 1 which is just 1 that's not infinity so we're not looking at that Next, we create our second limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x. Now, you can see the higher degree is in the denominator, which means this number is going to get really large while this one stays relatively smaller than this one. So this one gets super, super, super big while this one stays smaller than that. And anytime the denominator is way bigger than the numerator as x approaches infinity here, you are going to get a limit as x approaches infinity equal to zero. And we talked about that anytime your degree in the numerator is smaller than your degree in the denominator, the limit as x approaches infinity is going to equal zero. For part C, we rewrite this, and we have the limit as x approaches infinity of 3 to the x over x cubed. Now, the limit as x approaches infinity of x cubed, this is going to get big, but it's not going to get nearly as big as if your exponent is infinity. So if you have some constant here where your exponent is infinity, then you are going to get a massive number, and it's going to be even bigger than x to the third power as x approaches infinity. So the large number is going to be in the numerator here, and your small number is going to be down here. Here, which means that this limit is actually going to approach infinity. Technically, you already got it, but let's check out these just to make sure you know how to do them. So let's go ahead and rewrite our limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x. And you can see here that we again have x in our exponent. And anytime you're taking a limit as x approaches infinity and you have an x in the exponent, that's going to get bigger than anything else. So these you can disregard because these are going to get way bigger than those two numbers. So as x approaches infinity, these aren't even going to matter. Now, you can see, because they both have an e to the x, e to the x, they have the same degree in the numerator and denominator. So these are going to approach a limit, as x approaches infinity, of 3 over 2. Because you use your leading coefficients anytime you have the same degree in the numerator and denominator. For part e, I want you to remember your properties of logs. Now remember, we have the ln of 3 times x. The product property of logs says you can expand this and rewrite it ln of 3 plus ln of x. Same thing in the denominator, you have ln of 2 times x, which is the same as ln of 2 plus ln of x. Now, ln of 3 is a constant. ln of 2 is a constant. So those don't even matter. When you have the limit as x approaches infinity, you're going to plug in infinity up here, infinity up here. So these you can disregard. These, when you plug in infinity, they're the same. They have the same coefficients. So you're going to have 1 over 1 as x approaches infinity, which means you're going to have a limit of 1. So which of these is infinite? That would be choice C. Question four says, for what values of a does the limit as x approaches infinity of 3e to the x plus x cubed over a times e to the x plus x squared equal 3 halves? Now, I want you to recognize that this is a typical type of problem that they will ask on the AP test. And it's really easy. All you need to know is which terms in this rational function are the dominant ones. Which ones do you have to pay attention to and which ones can you disregard? So you have the limit as x approaches infinity. Now, because x is approaching infinity, the e to the x and the e to the x, those ones are going to get massive. We said anytime x is in the exponent and you're raising some constant to the x power, and you have the limit as x approaches infinity, that number is going to get bigger than anything else. So we have e to the x, e to the x. Those numbers are going to get bigger than anything else. We disregard these because they're going to get big, but not nearly as big as 2 point something to the infinity power. Same thing down here. So again, we disregard those. And 
because these have the same degree, which is x, we look at the coefficients. So the limit as x approaches infinity of this rational function is going to be 3 over a. Now, it says what value of a does the limit as x approaches infinity of this have to be in order to equal 3 halves? And in order to be 3 halves, a must be 2. Question five says, let f of x equal this function. Which of the following statements is or are true? So first, the limit as x approaches one of f of x exists. So can we find the limit of this function as x approaches one? Well, remember, limits aren't necessarily worried about what happens at the point x is equal to one. We're worried about what happens to the left and to the right of it. So we're gonna look at this function right here, this part of the function. So let's find the limit as that part of the function approaches one. Now, if I were to plug in one, I end up getting zero over zero. Now that's an indeterminate form. That doesn't mean that the limit does not exist. It's an indeterminate form, which means you have to go back and try to simplify this. So x squared minus one is a difference of squares, which we can factor out. And then you can see that the x minus ones actually cancel out. And when you plug in one, you end up getting a limit of two. So the limit as x approaches one of f of x equals two. So the limit does exist. Next, part two, f of one exists. So does f of one exist? Yeah, if you were to plug in one for this function, it says if x is equal to one, your y equals four. So we know f of one equals four, therefore that exists. Now part three is asking, is f continuous at x is equal to one? So we need to figure out whether the limit as x approaches one of this part of the function equals four. But we just figured out that the limit as x approaches one of that part of the function equals two. But when x is equal to 1, the y value is equal to 4 if we're looking at this part of the function. Therefore, these two things are not equal. So there's going to be a hole in the graph and then a point above it. So f is not continuous at x is equal to 1. Therefore, only 1 and 2 are true. And that's your answer. Now question six says, if f of x is equal to x squared minus x over two x for x not equal to zero and f of zero equals k, and if f is continuous at x equals zero, then k equals what? So let's first determine what this question is asking. It wants you to find k. And what k is, it's what the y value of this function is equal to when x is equal to zero. And we need this value to plug the hole created by this part of the function when x is equal to zero. So there's going to be a hole created by this function. And in order to fill that hole to make f continuous at x is equal to zero, you need the limit as x approaches zero of this function to equal k. We're going to take the limit as x approaches zero of this part of the function and set it equal to k because that's what we're trying to find. This function as x approaches zero must have the same y value as what k is going to equal when x is equal to zero for it to be continuous. So we take the limit as x approaches zero of this function. In order to determine that, we first plug it in. And when you plug it in, you end up getting zero over zero. Now that is an indeterminate form. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means you need to go back and you need to try to simplify this function a little further. So what we do is we factor out an x in the numerator, and then you can cancel out this x with the x in the denominator, and you're left with x minus 1 over 2. Now you can plug in your 0, and you end up getting 0 minus 1 over 2, which is negative 1 half. And we just said the limit as x approaches 0 of this part of the function must equal k in order to fill that hole. And this is going to be our k value. So negative 1 half is what k must be in order to fill the hole created by this part of the function. Now question seven says, so suppose f of x is equal to this rational function for x not equal to one, f of one is equal to negative three and f of two is equal to four. Then f is continuous and then it gives some options where it's not continuous and then the last one is just, it's continuous at all real numbers. So here's what we're gonna have to do. We're gonna have to take each one separately and figure out if f is continuous at that particular x value. So let's start with x is equal to one. We have our function here. We need to find the limit as x approaches one of this function and see if it is equal to negative three. If the limit as x approaches one of this function is equal to negative three, then this part of the function, f of one equals negative three, will fill the hole and make it continuous at x is equal to one. So this will not be the answer. So let's see we have the limit as x approaches one of our rational function. So what we do, we always plug in one first and see if we get a limit. We plug in one, we end up getting zero over zero. That's no good. What we need to do then is go back and try to simplify this. So down here, we can factor this denominator into x minus two times x minus one. We can then see that the x minus ones are gonna cancel out in the numerator and denominator and leave us with three x over x minus two. We can now plug in our one and we end up getting negative three. 
since the limit as x approaches 1 of this function is equal to negative 3. That means that there's going to be a hole at x is equal to 1. And then because this part of the function fills that hole at the same y value as your limit, it's going to be continuous at x is equal to 1. So this fills your hole created by this graph. Therefore, f is continuous at 1. So this cannot be our answer. Next, we go to B. We need to figure out if F is continuous at X is equal to two. So we take the limit as X approaches two and see if this fills the hole. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the limit, we plug in two to the function and we don't get zero over zero this time, we get six over zero. That means that there is a vertical asymptote at X is equal to two. So F cannot be continuous at X is equal to two. So that is definitely one of our answers, X is equal to two. Now let's keep looking, except at one or two well we said it is continuous at one because this fills the hole so this cannot be one of our answers part d says except at zero one or two we said one can't be an answer because it is continuous at one so we can cross that out if we wanted to just look at if it's continuous at x is equal to zero we could just plug in zero to the function and see that it is defined at x is equal to zero you get f of zero is equal to zero when you plug in zero for this function you get out zero so it is continuous and defined at x is equal to zero Lastly, it says at each number, it's obviously not continuous at each number if we determine that there was a vertical asymptote at x is equal to 2, therefore b is going to be your answer. Now question 8 says let f of x equal x squared plus x over x if x is not equal to 0 and 1 if x is equal to 0. Which of the following statements is or are true? So let's go through and figure out which ones are true. f of 0 exists. That means that when you plug in 0 for x, you get a number. Yes, that's what this whole part of the function is. f of 0 exists. That means when you plug in 0 for x, you get 1. So it does exist. Yeah. Part 2 says the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x exists. So does the limit as x approaches 0 of this part of the function exist, right? So let's figure it out. If we were to take the limit as x approaches 0, we plug in 0 for all these and you get 0 of 0. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. What it means is it's an indeterminate form, so you need to go back and try to simplify this. So we factor out x in the numerator, these cancel, and you're left with the limit as x approaches 0 of x plus 1. Plug in 0, you end up getting 0 plus 1 or 1 as your answer. So the limit as x approaches 0 is equal to 1. Yes, it does exist. Lastly, it says, is f continuous at x is equal to 0? So let's determine if this is true. We know that the limit as x approaches 0 of this part of the function is equal to 1. We also know that when you plug in 0 for the function, this part of the function lets you determine that your f of 0 is equal to 1. That means that the limit as x approaches 0 is equal to the function at x is equal to 0. Therefore, f has a filled hole at x is equal to 0. So there was a hole created by this portion of the graph. This portion of the function fills that hole. So f is continuous at x is equal to 0. That means that all three of these things are true and you're done.